Pleased to be joined again on the Eddie Hyde Cargo Connections with Sam Matthews, General Manager of Sweatenham Stud. Sam, good to see you again, sir. Good to see you, AP. Man, you guys have not one, not two, but three horses that have been sired by studs uh, from Sweatenham in the Everest. What does that say about Sweatenham and your success? Uh, it's it's incredible. It's it's such an exciting time for us. You know, we'll definitely be heading up there now. And I know last time we spoke, it was just Mars Crusader, and it just it shows how quickly things can change. Rubik had a pretty pretty tough year last year. He um, he was a little bit quiet on the track, and then this year he's absolutely taken off. And horse like Jack and O and and uh, Shades of Rose. It was just to see them make the field, and there's still two spots left. There's a chance we might even get a fourth one in there. So uh, yeah, at this stage, couldn't be more excited and three live chances. So much of horse racing is akin to life. Just when you think you're down and out, your fortunes can change and vice versa. How much of a jolt in the arm is this, though, for you, ownership, management, regular rank and file employees about, hey, we just got to keep doing what we're doing? It's when Jack and I won the group one a couple of weeks ago, Michael Kent Jr. called me straight after the race and he was he was so excited and we called all the staff and we had a bit of a party. You know, they don't happen all the time. Group one uh, winners by your Stalin. So you have to celebrate the successes. As you said, it's not always success. So when it does come along, you have to uh, have to take it. And it's it's given him a huge amount of, of resurgence with numbers. So uh, he's got some fantastic mares, a number of Group 1 winners and Group 1 producers booked to him on the back of that. And uh, people have really seen what we've been saying, which is that Rubik's going to come back. He's going to have this resurgence and he's still got the big books to come. So, uh, yeah, it's, it couldn't have been better timing. And uh, fingers crossed for next Saturday. Eddie Hunt Cargo Connections, I'm A.P. Harold. He's Sam Matthews, General Manager of Sweat and Stud. Let's compare and contrast each of the stallions and their Everest racing offspring. We'll start with Toronado and Mass Crusader. How are these horses similar? And of course, they're not the same horse. How are they different? They look very similar. They're very much peas in a pod. Uh, Mars Crusader is a magnificent looking horse, but interestingly, his speed comes more from the female side. So She's Got Gears was a, a very speedy early type, whereas Toronado was obviously world champion miler. So you would expect probably the progeny to be 12 to 1400. Mars Crusader is a, is a beast at 1200 and, and he'll be very, very competitive as we saw last weekend in the Premier Stakes. Uh, the speed comes from, from her side, the stamina and the strength can come from his side as well. So the, the mix there is, is pretty even. So if I, if I whistle at Mass Crusader's mom and say she's got sexy legs, it's true, she, she's got them. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, and they're fast too. Hey, what about uh, Rubik and, and Jackano? How are they similar and different? They're probably on the opposite side of the spectrum. Rubik was was a real speed horse. You know, he's, he's not an overly big horse, but he's just a fast ball of muscle. And uh, and his dam, that pedigree, its inference is a very close relation. And he won around with guineas. And it's more that sort of um, miler side. So the speed comes from the sire and that stamina comes from the female line. It's an enormous family. Jack and O's family is, is absolutely incredible family. Um, but he can probably step out. He was favourite for Caulfield Guineas at one stage over a mile before they decided to go to the Everest. So he's probably a bit more diverse. He's probably 1,200 up to 1,600. So not a family reunion where you want to be paying for the oats or you're going to go uh, deep into debt. Yeah, yeah. You'd want to be hoping that uh, they run it quickly and, uh, and forget to do another lap. Uh, Rubik and, and a great name for, for a horse, Shades of Rose, compare and contrast. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Gillard there, he, uh, he bred the horse and, and that's a real speed family. Um, Bjorn Baker's done an exceptional job taking her through the ranks. It's great to see a filly in the race and, and there hasn't been a huge number of fillies um, contest the Everest. So she's in there, she's a speed family. She's just gone on the up and up. She's probably the one that um, we didn't necessarily expect to be in there. She's the one that sort of came out of the blue. And when she won the group two, I think the plan was to go to the paddock, but Bjorn just said she was going so well that uh, while we sent her to the paddock, she's thriving. And, and then they picked up this slot and uh, she looks like she's a very, very live chance. Sam, you grew up on the western part of your island continent in Australia. How does the, the racing industry differ on, on that side of the continent from the more heavily populated east coast? I think the, the Stalin, Stalin's over there without you know, trying to be too negative. It's probably not as commercial over there. Um, most people over there that, that own broodmares outside of a couple of big breeders are probably those farmers like we were that have three, four, five mares and they're breeding them to those $5,000 service fees. Um, they don't have the, the home affairs at $100,000, the Toronado's at $80,000. It just doesn't happen over there. It's a very different market. And if they do have those quality mares, like Bob Peters, for example, he's a big supporter of, of Toronado and of Rubik, and he always has been. He sends them across, across this way. But uh, just quality of stallion is, is certainly not there at this stage. It may come back, but uh, fantastic racing. But um, quality of stallion probably just isn't quite at the same level. And I guess in the vast interior of Australia, you'd be racing camels more than horses, right? That's, that's the big desert. 
funny story for you, we actually did race a camel once. Uh, so it was a bush meeting and my whole family were there and it was $500 to buy a camel. So you go and inspect them all and you buy it for the race. Uh, ours got loose, um, dropped the jockey, never to be seen again. Uh, obviously the, the horse fencing probably wasn't good enough for the camel. So uh, there's one wild one out there that we probably still own, uh, but uh, it did win the race, but you have to win the race with the jockey on a bit like the thoroughbred. So uh, it didn't quite go to plan. Disappearing jockeys, camels, and the great desert of the interior of Australia. You never know what you're going to learn about on the Anyhow Cargo Connections, especially when Sam Matthews is our guest <laughs> for the second time. Sam, as we return to look at the Everest nature strip, inappropriately so, is, is almost everyone's favorite. But a horse race, it's not a one versus one. It's a one versus 11 others. And there's a very good chance that nature strip doesn't win. Let's look at the best case scenarios for each of the three Swettenham connected horses. What has to break right? We'll start with Mass Crusader for that horse to, to emerge as the victor. He is probably a victim of his own circumstances sometimes because he'll more than likely sit last or he'll sit close to the tail. Uh, there has to be speed on for him. Uh, so in a perfect world, it would be Nature Strip and uh, potentially Eduardo going head to head up front. And hopefully they, they cut at each other pretty heavily and, and put up very strong sectionals. He needs a, a soft track, good to soft. If it gets to the heavy range, he's probably not as effective in that in that heavy range. So um, he needs a few things to go right. But as we saw on the weekend and in the Everest last year, uh, his his closing sectionals are just outstanding. So he'll be he'll be a fair way off them. But if they go really hard up front, it, it really opens it up for him. It's interesting. Horse racing is so much like ancient or even modern warfare, where you take a look at hey, if this tribe or group if they can go to war with this one and knock each other down, then we'll sneak around the side and come in. Isn't there a lot of that, that game planning and strategy, right? Absolutely. And, and the amount, yeah, speed maps is something that, um, that we use when we're trying to do race form. We might have the favourite in the race. And if, if we don't map correctly, if we draw the outside and we know we're going to try it, we've got a lead, we'll scratch from that race. And you, and you have to. You, you need to give your horse the best opportunity. If you're getting six runs a year into it, you don't want to waste one because you know you're not going to be a chance. So, uh, yeah, the amount of data that goes into it and sectionals and uh, and ratings and and speed maps, it's, there's a lot behind it. You need uh, a mathematical degree to be able to work it out, but hence why we've got other people to help us with that. Shades of Rose, what has to break right for, for Shades of Rose being the winner's circle? I think she she can go on all surfaces, which is fantastic. It uh, doesn't matter if they get, I think it's going to be a heavy 10 up there this weekend, and it may be more than likely to be close to heavy range up there for the Everest as well. So I'll, I'll, she can go on all surfaces. She'll be handy, um, but she won't be up there in the speed battle that I think, I, I believe Nature Strip and Eduardo, depending on the draw, will, will both be up there and uh, be a bit of a speed battle. She'll sit off them, but she'll be in the forward half. And uh, if they're going hard enough and she can just have that extra turn of foot just to get around them, she'll have to step up. I think most people know that she'll have to step up, but Mare's in form, Philly's in form, you follow them and they certainly can, can do that. I may head to the OTB and see if I can do a, a digital worldwide bet on this next horse because it's it's my pick to, to, for an upset. Giacchino, what has to happen there to knock off Nature Strip? His turn of foot, like that, that Golden Rose win, he is is a, been a sensation. And, and because he's got that big pedigree behind him that, that does have a, a little bit of extra distance there, he's not a 1,200-meter horse through and through. He actually can get, get out to a bit of a trip. So if it's a heavier track, it might be more like a 1,300-meter race. And he can handle all surfaces. He can go, you probably don't want it into a heavy range, but a soft six would be fine for him. He'll be sitting midfield, maybe a little bit worse than midfield. And we saw it last weekend with a quality field of group one horses that when he says go, he can absolutely turn it on. And I think it's it's fantastic that it's the three of them are never going to be in the same position, the same at the race. If we've got a real speed battle, and then we're probably Mass Crusader is a bit more of a chance. If there's not much speed, Shades of Rose can probably get past them. And if there's enough speed, but but not too much speed, it gives Jack and I a chance. So we've sort of got them placed, like you said, with the army in uh, in the right places and uh, gives us every opportunity. Sam, it's so fun to, to analyze these things, both hypothetically and looking back at tape. But horse races by their nature are very, very quick. Even the longest ones are a couple of minutes and they're done. When we think of human team sports, I'm a huge baseball fan. And in the States, the Atlanta Braves were 10 and a half games back. They play 162. They won the division. You can really take your time. You can write articles. You can analyze this stuff. How frustrating but also deliciously beautiful is it in horse racing that it all happens like that and you have to accept that and then the scheming and dreaming and plotting and planning has to be done at other times? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of preparation that goes into it. And then uh, somebody who's 54 kilos jumps on the back of the horse 
and uh, they it's up to them from there. So the trainer can't do any more. The owners typically don't have a huge amount of say anyway, outside of maybe a bit of, bit of tactical stuff, but uh, it comes down to the jockey. But the horse, you know, they've got minds of their own as well. If that horse really wants to go, it wants to go. If it's got a tiny little niggle, one of our stallions, he had a, an, uh, on his wither, a little ingrown hair there, and that affected him. Uh, on the day, there might be a divot in the ground. There might be a bird that flies past. There might be a crowd. They might not like the crowd at the Everest. That it's going to be enormous and loud. It's There's so many different things that come into it where as soon as that horse leaves the mounting yard, it's in the hands of the horse, in the hands of the jockey and the mind of the horse, and, and you hope for the best. Do you see young people who come into the industry and they love horses, and they love the excitement, but they have to get used to that as there's no timeouts. The coach can't call a timeout and have a huddle. There's no do-overs. You know, as, as we say, you pay, you pay your money, you take your chances, and it's, it's the ultimate pay your money, take the chances sport, isn't it? Absolutely. About all you can do is yell, and it doesn't really help if you yell. It normally annoys the person next to you, and uh, most of the time when you're yelling, you get beaten. And I, what I say to all, all of our staff and everyone that's coming into the in industry is that just remember that nine times out of ten, you're going to lose. Probably in a field of 15, 14 of those horses are going to lose. So you have to be aware, and that's why you have to celebrate the successes. And, and absolutely, Nature Strip is going to be hes going to be very, very hard to beat. His sectionals are enormous. What he did in the UK is incredible. Um, he's going to be a very hard horse to beat, but... Uh, We've seen a lot of good horses go down and uh, anything can happen. So you've got to have a ticket in the raffle and, uh, and do all you, all you can do to try to uh, get that result. That's a great expression, have a ticket in the raffle. Sam Matthews is our guest, general manager of Swettenham Stud down in Australia. And of these three horses we just discussed, Shades of Rose, Jack and O, and of course, uh, Mass Crusader, which of these horses do you think, just in the abstract, is best suited for 1,200 metres? It really does depend on the track. Uh, I think um, I, I think the track is going to play, um, if it plays even, let's say it's a soft five, which in my opinion is, is an ideal track. I think track, if the pace is even, I think Jackano is probably the one. Um, he's the horse. We'd, he's won the group one. We'd love to see him, to, for Rubik to have two Everest winners uh, would be would be amazing. Mars Crusader, uh, he's going very, very well. Uh, Shades of Roses on the up. It's so hard to know... Um, on the day, it might be a little bit easier, but uh, there's all in markets and there's lots of things that can happen. We've already seen snap dance pulled out of the Everest. Um, so different things can happen at various times. If there's a huge amount of rain, it probably rules one out. If there's no rain, it probably rules another one out. Uh, there's, there's so many things that can happen. And uh, on the morning, how they're feeling, uh, it's, it's very exciting, but it's very hard to know. You guys in Australia are known for the sprinters. Uh, so closing speed is very, very important. Uh, this is really in many ways, it's a hybrid between the quarter horses that are so big in America and the longer, uh, at least in America, we have that the Belmont Stakes is what, a mile and a half. This is in that, that mid range. Which of these three horses out of Swettenham has the best closing speed? Uh, certainly, Mars Crusader has the best closing speed, uh, but it's a, a bit like Chautauqua, I suppose, you know, um, where Sam Keller's is Chautauqua and, and it had to have the best closing speed because he sat so far back. Um, I think Jack and O probably has the best burst of speed. Um, you know, if, if in that sort of 150 to 200 metres that he has the best burst of speed. And Shades of Rose, she, she can actually just continue to accelerate all the way through. So it depends on how far off they are. Um, obviously, we'd love all three of them to dead heat would be the perfect scenario. But I, I think if we had Jack and O finishing very, very quickly, 200 metres, um, I think he's probably the one with the best burst of speed. Sam, I love your imagination. I didn't even thought about that. That would be... I mean, Hollywood would be down to Australia in a nanosecond if the sixth iteration of the Everest was a triple dead heat between three horses from Swettenham Stud. I, get, cut me in on 5% of the movie rights, okay? <laughs> Always the best thing to do, the thing that we could do, if we made sure that the photo finish camera malfunctioned, that gives us an every, every chance because then there's no actual photo there. And we, you know, hopefully the stewards can't work it out from the video footage and we say three-way dead heat. So... If that happens, uh, it would be a pretty, and you're obviously more than welcome to the party at Swettenham State if that does happen. I appreciate it. Hey, um, I was watching a, a video on, on Australia the other day and it was explaining how so much of the interior is dry and you guys don't get as, as much rain as you'd ideally like. But let's imagine a case where you just got soaked, okay, for two days before, and this is a really wet, nasty track. Which of your three horses has the best shot then? Shades of Rose. Yeah, without, without a shadow of a doubt. And I think that's a very, very live chance of happening at, at our farm at the moment. We're due 70 millimetres of rain at, at the moment. 
Uh, there's a farm up not too far away from, from Sydney. Uh, they're due an inch of rain um, in the next week. I think there's a live chance, and we saw it last year with the helicopter having to dry the truck out. So they actually flew a helicopter as low as they could just to try to dry it out a little bit. I think it's a very, it's a big chance of a, of a heavy track and it, it does happen. If that's the case, I think Shades of Rose is certainly the one. Um, anything up past a, probably a heavy eight, it's probably Shades of Roses to, to lose of the three. The brilliant creativity, the leadership, the allure of Australia is the, the international acclaim of this race. Of course, the quality of the sprinters, the Everest is surging in popularity. What impact, if any, is this going to have potentially down the road, or maybe you're already seeing it, is saying, hey, you know what? While we don't want to specifically breed for just one race, we would love to be competitive in the Everest. It's such a big deal. And, and how could that come into play? I think we, we certainly do breed for speed. And, and if you can breed for a golden slipper, then you're probably breeding for an Everest anyway down the line. Uh, I think we're, you know, a lot of our, uh, the Coolmore is, is probably the stallion making race uh, down the straight at Flemington for three year olds. And I think we already breed for speed, but this allows horses that are a little bit older uh, just to, you know, I think Musk, uh, Musk Crusade would be six, uh, Eduardo must be eight, uh, Nature Strip would be eight as well. They're, they're certainly not, uh, they're more in the twilight of their careers than, uh, than these early up and coming horses. So it just gives them an opportunity to race on for enormous prize money against group one horses and have the world watching, but not have to do it only as a two-year-old or as a three-year-old. I may get in trouble with my Sunday school teacher, but I think it was it was King Solomon who who solved the, the issue of the two women were claiming that the baby was theirs. And he said, well, we'll just cut it in half. And of course, the real mom said, no, 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 we'll give it to the other woman because I'm not going to kill my baby. I bring that up to say, if you had to pick, you know, one of your three babies here, one of these three horses, and I'm only going to give you one because that's I'm going to grill you here, Matthews, and get after you. Who is it and why? I, I would have to say Jackano would be the one Mars Crusader, he, he'll get another opportunity and he's been there before. Shades of Rose still has more. She obviously raced Philly. She's got plenty ahead of her. Whereas Jackano, he's he's going to go to stud. He's already a group one winner by Rubik and he's going to have a stud career. So this may be his last opportunity. And I would absolutely love to see, not only for Rubik to get a second Everest winner, but but for Lindsay Maxted, the connections and Cormore, who's slot they're in, for him to be able to win that. They've done it once before with, with their slot, with the son of Rubik, with in yes, yes, yes. I'd love that to happen because the other two will both get another opportunity at some stage. You know, all things being equal, they'll both get another chance. So uh, he'd be the one if, if you absolutely made me pick. Um, I wish we weren't recording this because I'm sure somebody involved in Mars Crusader or Shades of Rose is going to see it, but purely Blame, blame it on me, Matthews. I, I set you up, okay? I blame, I blame everything on you, AP. That's not a problem. I appreciate it. Thanks. That's, that's, that's par for the course. Yes, yes, yes. It's a great name for a horse. You know, maybe, maybe an offspring, perhaps, possibly, maybe. Could be a good name for offspring. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. The name actually came from uh, Matt Scown, who, who works with Bray Sikolsky. He was working for Inglis at the time. And when he was taking bids, uh, he says, yes, yes, yes. So uh, that's actually where the name came from. Um, so yeah, John Foote purchased him and, uh, and then he went on to do what he did. And obviously now he's got, uh, got foals on the ground and off he goes. When we look at, and of course, uh, the favorite here, Nature Strip, and, and deservedly so, there's 12 horses in the field. Would you want to be right next to Nature Strip, a few horses away? If Nature Strip's in the one hole, would you want to be in the 12 and, and, and why? I would love to see another horse, a sacrificial lamb, for, for example. I would love to see another horse really go head to head with Nature Strip and push him because we know he, he wants to be right up there. If he gets it too easy, it's, it's, it's over and done with. But uh, you, you don't want to be that sacrificial lamb because you know he's got the motor. You know he's got, you know, from start to finish, he can keep going. I'd love to see something else um, just really push him as hard as I can. And I'd, I'd love to be sitting midfield if I was, uh, obviously I'm not a jockey, but if I was a jockey and, and I was on a live chance, I'd love to be sitting midfield, you know, fifth, fourth, fifth, um, potentially a little bit further back and have them go head to head up front and then come over the top. You know, in, in, in human racing, they hire the pace centers or the pace runners for a marathon. Somebody might go out hard for five miles and they're going to burn out or maybe even, maybe even half the marathon. I don't think that's quite... Uh, the story in horse racing, but as you mentioned, sometimes that just transpires and that's probably the best bet for any horse, your three or the others, is somebody burns out nature strip and then you sneak in at the wire and clip it. Absolutely. I, go, I think that's the only way that you can, you can beat him. If he gets it up front, if he draws wide, he's got the gate speed to be able to cross. But if he, if he draws on the inside and he jumps well, which he normally does and nothing takes him on, 
I think it, it'll be very, very hard to beat. But if something does take him on or he draws wide and they, they do keep him wide, you know, it does happen with favourites that a few of the jockeys think, you know, let's, let's see what he's got and they'll try and keep him a little bit wide and push him along. I'd, I'd love to see it happen. Uh, but can anything keep up with him? And do you want to be that sacrificial lamb? In saying that, you still get $400,000 for running last. So um, to be the one to push Nature Strip and give someone else a crack, you know, I'm sure that somebody would be very appreciative of that. Yeah, absolutely. No cactus or cacti this time for Sam Matthews, the fine general manager of Sweatenham Stud. We appreciate you joining us once again on the Etihad Cargo Connections. Best of wishes to not one, not two, but all three of your horses in the upcoming Everest. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks, AP. Hopefully we're speaking on the 16th. You bet. Take care.